we've put ourselves in worlds of avatars mm -hmm. and we're creating a virtual world almost in our image, you know? Yeah. And there's that's, a, there's that's, a, that's tempting yeah. to do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. To create a world, quote unquote, in our image, you know, giving ourselves a new image in the virtual world, contrary to who we truly are. Welcome back to Roundtable, a podcast produced by Mid-America Reform Seminary. This is episode 43, and I'm Jared Luchibor, joined this morning with Reverend Andrew Compton. How you doing this morning, Reverend? I'm doing well. It's good to be back, Jared. Well, you might recall a while back um, a couple of episodes that Reverend Compton and I did on the church and media and technology. Uh, we're going to zone in just a little further this time and talk about a much talked about platform that many of us are all too familiar with, and that is social uh, media. I'm on social media, Reverend Compton, you're on social media, I am Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, my job in content creation utilizes social media to an incredible degree. Uh, as, you know, it's a it's a platform that can be a boon for Christians, but unfortunately has many uh, negative aspects to it that can produce some bad habits. Uh, it might be best for us, you know, in this conversation on social media uh, to discuss not necessarily calling them pros and cons, but maybe best practices and bad habits for Christians on social media. And when I say sh social media, thinking um, primarily of the way we interact and um, speak, so to speak, um, through our text um, responses to those on social media and how we're reacting to those in uh, the webosphere, yeah. um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Perhaps you want to elaborate more on what this idea of, of speech or text is on on social media and, and how... Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it is, you know, a lot of people anymore, and I'm... I, I I guess I assume that many of our listeners are in some way or another involved in social media. It might even be as minor as you're on social media just so you can access your church's prayer chain. A lot of church prayer chains are now on Facebook or prayer groups and things like that. And and so a lot of people will, will use it even minimally, even if they're not actively posting pictures or posting comments or interacting with other people's, uh, other people's um, posts or shares or whatever. But but it is interesting how there's a lot of pastors and a lot of writers wrestling with how Christians are using social media. Um, the uh, There's a newish book, 2019, by Samuel uh, T. Logan called The Good Name, The Power of Words to Hurt or Heal. And Sam Logan even has a whole section on social media. What's interesting is he's, he's noting uh, that there's this problem with how Christians use social media, and yet how Christians are speaking on the internet, how Christians are using social media is, is actually part of a larger problem that a lot of people have noticed. So he cites a cover story from Time Magazine in 2016, which spoke of something called the online disinhibition effect. The online disinhibition hmm. effect. That's a mouthful, I know. Right. Um, and and in this, uh, this article written by Joel Stein that, that um, Sam Logan is citing points out this online disinhibition effect uh, in which factors like anonymity, invisibility, and lack of authority, and not communicating in real time, strip away the mores society spent millennia building. Right? Here's these. these we, we've learned basically how to talk with people face to face, but the internet, um, the internet's very nature and social media's very nature means that the normal things that keep us in check and promote good communication are stripped away, mm -hmm. again, creating this, this disinhibition effect. People talk about losing their inhibitions when they drink too much alcohol, right? That's why people who are drunk begin to, to spout off and, and just can say terrible things. And, and you're saying that's being analogous. You're saying that's being reflected on social media. There's today. something analogous to okay. that. You lose your inhibition. I'm right. not looking you in the eye. I'm mm -hmm. not watching you wince right. when I make some offhand comment. You know, yep. um, that that's supposed to trigger something about my humanity and about your your image bearing. Uh, instead, I'm just throwing a what seems to be a a neutral uh, string of words up on a screen. Well, you can't you can't gauge a certain level of emotion through text or even emojis. 
You're right, right. Right. Yeah, even emojis don't don't here's an effort to try to reclaim some semblance of facial expression. And interesting, even you, you can even get these emojis that actually look like you. Right. And 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 yet even then they're still there there's something that's lost in the translation. We've put ourselves in worlds of avatars mm-hmm. and we're creating a virtual world almost in our image, you know. Yeah. And there's that's, a, there's that's, a, that's tempting. Yeah. To do. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. To create a world, quote unquote, in our image, you know, giving ourselves a new image in the virtual world, contrary to who we truly are. There's a, it's, it's really remarkable how many people are noting this. Again, this is outside of, of distinctively Christian circles. A recent article in the Dispatch uh, by, um, who wrote this? Andrew Egger, commenting on the new social media site Parlay. Looks like Parler, but those of us who know, I guess a slice of French would... Or- we're yeah. supposed to say parlay, <laughs> uh, you know. But but he points out here the chief difficulty is that trying to get people on the internet to actually behave as if they were in a public place has been universally acknowledged to be a Sisyphean task since the web's earliest days. Remember Sisyphus was that Greek uh, hero, I guess, or maybe anti-hero was trying to push the boulder uphill. Uh, right? yep, yep, yep. There's our there's our our little cultural reference there, but. It's recognized that people don't behave well on the internet, um, and and so what do we do in the church, right? We 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 did our we had our discussion about words and uh, or I'm sorry about um, use of media and use of the internet. Um, how should Christians be thinking about this? If the world's recognizing this as a problem, are Christians recognizing this as a problem? Right. Uh, I hope so, and I think um, a good way to tackle that is by. Um, reflecting on the sixth and the ninth commandment a little bit, especially as it's expressed in uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. Do you want to elaborate on those two things just a little bit? Yeah, sure. What's what's neat uh, is how regularly our catechisms um, of the Reformation era um, really recognize the heart at various of the Ten Commandments that... Um, you know that when when we read the uh, the sixth commandment, for example, um, you know, uh, "Thou shalt not murder." Uh, the the catechisms, the re- reformed uh, theologians and pastors have have never been content to tell their congregations. So go out this morning and don't knife anybody. Amen. Go in peace. Right. Well, no. There's what's what else is going on in the temptation to murder somebody to attack somebody and the the catechisms really un, unpack a, a number of the implications of why we shouldn't murder and in fact how we should behave instead so the heidelberg has some wonderful things i don't know if you if anything stands out you want to read sure i mean right there at the very beginning what does god require in the 6th commandment this is lord's day uh 40 105 q and a yep that i neither in thought nor in word or gesture dishonor, hate, wound, or kill my neighbor, uh, whether by myself or by another. But another thing that sticks out to me is that I would uh, nor willfully expose myself to Mm -hmm. any danger. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a sense in which we're exposing ourselves to danger on social media, if we can, if we can call it that? Oh, sure, sure. Even my translation even uses the wording, uh, I'm not to belittle my neighbor, belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to belittle people uh, on the internet again because of that disinhibition mm-hmm. uh, that we feel. I'm struck even by the language of question 107. Is it enough then that we do not murder our neighbor in any such way? Answer no. By condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Okay, that's a key thing. Is, is my wording loving? And of course, I've met people who are very, I believe, very harsh on the internet. And they would claim they're being loving. They're re- they're rebuking wrong. Well, we can talk about that in a minute. But um, but but we do need to ask that question: Are we really loving our neighbors as ourselves, um, or are we just loving our desire of looking right and our desire to do we love our ability to spout off at the mouth and feel in control? It's much easier because I've I've um, with particular people sometimes on social media, I've found even by myself over the years being able to speak rather differently to them on social media but when i see them in person my mm. love it is expressed in a much different way mm-hmm. it's <laughs> it's yep. not there's there's no there's no vitriol you know in person mm-hmm. i i mean mm-hmm. it was just you know a week before uh 
you know, I may have had some sort of a theological debate or an argument where some things that were exchanged that should not have been. But then when mm-hmm. you see that person in person for the first time since that argument, mm-hmm. it's mind boggling how, mm-hmm. how different your speech is to mm-hmm. this person. Mm-hmm. When it even goes on, God wants us to love our neighbors, but also to be patient, peace, loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them pr- to protect them from harm as much as we can. And to do good, even to our enemies. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, this is this is all uh, tied into the sixth commandment. Look how that plays out on the on the internet. I mean, if we're in the midst of a political uh, discussion on Facebook, are we being patient with our comments? Am I responding to you know somebody somebody posts an article? This is why my candidate's the best one and your candidate's the worst one. Uh, am, I, am I being patient in my response? Am I being patient even in formulating my response? Mm-hmm. Or am I just going to write in and say, no, you're an absolute moron, you know, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation yeah, right. point. You know, is that, or, or is that really patience there? What if I instead thought through, how are they going to hear this? What can I say that might get them to mitigate their speech a little bit? Wouldn't that be a victory if I... if even if my my social media connection and I didn't agree, uh, what if we had at least more nuanced rhetoric? Uh, and what if that was my goal rather than just getting them to go for my candidate? Right. You know. So a patient response, uh, a peace loving response, mm-hmm. one that's not going to inflame. You know, if I if I write your article shows that you're a, you're a complete idiot. You know, what if instead I said I, I can see you're passionate about this. Um, have you considered that actually there's some weaknesses in in this regard as well, right? Isn't that a way to promote a healthy discussion, Mm -hmm. to promote peace or a gentle one, a merciful one, a friendly uh, response? Sometimes I wonder, you know, um, one aspect of social media and our conversations that we have on it that um, can inflame our um, desires to speak differently on social media is the fact that there's one thing that's very different on social media than there is in our in-person conversations, as obvious as that might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's that on social media, we're having, if it's not a direct message, it's a public conversation. We know that we're having this argument or, or quote unquote, one-on-one with somebody Mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a, well, timeline chain or a newsfeed conversation. And we know that there are many, many people watching Uh, Mm -hmm, one mm -hmm. conversation unfold Mm -hmm. and what happens when you do that i think sometimes you might say things that's going to draw the attention of of supporters Mm -hmm. and then when you see um say for example that your uh reaction or comment to somebody is gaining more traction Mm -hmm. with the amount of likes and heart signs and care symbols and the other person is not can give us a false perception of success in 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 winning an argument or um feeling that you're um because you feel successful in this mm-hmm. argument that it's the, the what you're saying and how you're saying it is good yeah. you know isn't that ironic if you were if you were really trying to engage this other person on this point of debate political theological what what have you biblical um wouldn't wouldn't the godly response to be that when you write your reply, wouldn't you want the person you're talking with to like your comment? Wouldn't that mm-hmm. be the greater right. thing? Rather than like, oh good, I've got my 15 peeps over here. Mm-hmm. Ha ha, we're all ganging up on right. you. Look how we're winning. It's us versus you. But what if that comment was the kind of thing where where your opponent was liking it mm-hmm. and they wrote back and you were able to like their comment right. as you go back and forth? Mm-hmm. Now, is that just being cheesy? Are we just being too lovey-dovey? Right. And are you and I just snowflakes here well, as the rhetoric is sometimes said and we can't deal with a good, you know, a good uh, a good dust up? And a, it's and akin good... to when we're having an in-person conversation and someone's talking and you're nodding your head. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, maybe having a smile or two at them in a friendly conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way of, of thinking about it. You know, when I'm... If if you and I are sitting here disagreeing over something, uh, I'm not I'm not trying to speak so loud that invites people who are also here in the building to come in and stand on my side of the right. table yep. so that we can all look down our noses mm-hmm. at you. Right. Um, it it forces me instead to actually communicate with you. That would be such an interesting, you know, comedic video if social media conversations played out in real life. Yeah, I'm sure somebody's done <laughs> Some, it. I'm sure someone has. But what about the um, 
uh, the ninth commandment mm-hmm. as well. Um, you talk about bearing false witness against mm-hmm. people, yeah. social media. Yeah, the ninth commandment, the way the Heidelberg spells out uh, that, that idea of false witness. Answer, that I never give false testimony against anyone, twist no one's words, nor gossip or slander, nor join in condemning anyone rashly without a hearing. Rather, I should avoid under penalty of God's wrath every kind of lying and deceit as the very works of the devil. And in court and everywhere else, I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. And I should do what I can to defend and advance my neighbor's honor and reputation. I mean, you, there, there's right away some, some reminders of, of valuing the truth, right? We should speak the truth candidly. And there's often times where in the midst of a theological discussion online or a debate or a political debate, right, we want to value the truth. And it's a right thing to value the truth, as it says, even be candid about the truth. Um, and yet look how there's also this desire to advance the neighbor's honor and reputation. I mean, is it possible to actually speak truth in ways that that protect the honor of somebody who disagrees? Yeah. That's definitely much harder to do on social media than it is in person, I'm mm-hmm. sure. The one thing that really sticks out for me when it comes to gossip and slander on social media is that I think that um, gossip outside of social media normally starts in very huddled conversations with the one being gossiped about not in tune with what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I feel like on social media, it's almost the exact opposite. It's not a huddled conversation anymore. It's a full-blown expose um, of someone who is seeing the beginning of a conversation happen right away about them. It is interesting how even the news, I've noticed that the news, well, I don't watch a ton of news, but uh, that's itself a stressful thing because of some of the same things we're talking about here. But, <laughs> but more and more and more, um, it's it's common to see a report where they are putting a screenshot of the Twitter feed of some politician or the Twitter feed of some church leader, and here it is up there, or a Facebook post by somebody. Right? This is um, that's just an example of um, this is a very public venue. And some would say, mm-hmm. well, I'm, you know, maybe they're going to try to comment in a private group or they're going to have a try to have a privacy setting uh, that, that doesn't allow people to see it. You know, with a word, if I say something to you in a fit of uh, when I'm losing my discretion, um, saying something um, in anger, I mean, that word is going to cause its own damage. Right. And I can't really unring that bell. Uh, but Lord willing, um, as I ask your forgiveness, and I, I, I tell you that I want to glorify God with my speech, uh, even when we disagree. You know what? By God's grace, y- your memory of that harsh word will, will begin to fade and yeah. be overwhelmed by my kind words and my, my upbuilding words to you. But with social media, even if I repent of that word, even if I delete that tweet, I mean, it's out there. Mm-hmm. There's some cachet somewhere that's got it. Yep. Someone may have already screenshotted it, mm-hmm. put it on you know CNN or Fox News. Uh, somebody's already put something somewhere. Right. Um, it's it's being it's being filed away for use in some trial. It's being filed away for use in some charges. Or right, it's out there. Right. And you talk about Twitter, and I feel like that can be that's it's such an interesting platform because of the way um, its interface, where you only have a certain amount of characters or words uh, that you can type in, and because we're so limited in that. You're almost forced to choose very carefully what you want to say in a a small block. But if you want to say something really fast, you're not giving yourself plenty of time to think carefully about what it is that you're going to write. And those 120 or 150 characters or whatever it is now um, can prove to have long lasting effects. You know, there was a, a, a really interesting thing that Sam Logan noted in his book, The Good Name. And he was noting how a couple of years ago there was a lot of uh, academic discussion over the nature of works and grace in the Mosaic Covenant. And a lot of uh, Reformed and Presbyterian biblical scholars and theologians were, were trying to grapple with that. Sometimes it's called the republication debate. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sam Logan talks about the fact that, that the Orthodox Presbyterian Church released about a 100-page report by a, a, a very fine group of, of scholars um, really working out the details of this. And he said he got this report and went, are you kidding me, 100 pages to talk about this? But he said as he read through it and when he got done, he, he said, you know, 
there's a lot of distinctions necessary to really understand what everybody is saying in this in this uh, in this discussion. And he said it really needed a hundred pages to treat it with integrity and and to treat it so that it shed light and and didn't just Im- apply heat. And uh, and he's and and to your point, right? You couldn't do that in a tweet. Right. Tweet wars over the nature of works and grace in the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, blog wars over the work nature mm-hmm. of works and grace in the Mosaic Covenant. Facebook wars over that um, can't do what a hundred page report can do. And quite frankly, that one hundred page report is one source in a much larger corpus of, right. of things. It's just an example of how limited social media can be and unable to capture the same kinds of distinctions distinctions necessary for um, for real positive. Uh, conversation. So if you have something to say to your friend, write them a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, let's move on to what we as Christians can do to just overcome a lot of the the vitriolic things we uh, see or are tempted to do on social media, how we can temper our behavior on social media, mm-hmm. um, how we um, can prevent facilitating bragging, promoting jealousy, entertaining gossip or slander, um, creating an environment of anxiety for, for us or for others, mm-hmm. and cultivating an environment that's not distracting us from what's essential and what's important. What's, what's, what are a few baby steps that, that us as Christians can take? It seems to me one way, one thing that's really valuable for us on social media is to to just mentally draw together spoken words and typed words into the same category mm, of godly speech. That's good. And really start to 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 be aware of the fact that when I'm typing, either with my thumbs on my phone or on my laptop or whatever I'm using, I'm doing the same thing as when I'm I'm speaking with my mouth. Right. Um and, and even to visualize insofar as we're able the, the that other person we're talking with. And some of that will really help us then put our social media discussion and identity into our larger Christian identity, and namely that as being God's ambassadors. Uh, Paul Tripp has a really useful book from a few years ago called War of Words, Getting to the Heart of Your Communication Struggles. But one way he gets at at, uh, at the way through these communication struggles is to recognize that we're God's ambassadors. So we need to recognize that identity. I'm... I, I'm created in the image of a, of a speaking God, a God who creates with speech and who gives me creaturely analogs to that. My, my speech is able to, uh, is to do some powerful things. For example, Ephesians 4.29 talks about, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, uh, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Uh, echoing in a lot of ways, Proverbs sixteen twenty four. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Right, the Lord is the healer. The Lord is the life giver. The Lord is the the, the grace giver. And look how even people with words have have a, an analogous kind of role um, interpersonally. But but if we can have that understanding that we're God's ambassadors, and then secondly, we can we need to understand the King's mission. What is His goal for for our words? And, and also, what are his methods? Uh, Tripp says we need to have an understanding of the king's methods. And that's where going to Scripture, going to Proverbs, uh, going to... Um, well, James has a lot of language on speech. Uh, there's ways we can begin to practice uh, the, the, the ambassadorial skills necessary uh, to function in this way with our speech. Sure. One other way we can uh, move forward too, I think is by just learning about people, Hmm. getting to know them in ways uh, on social media. But even if we're engaging them in um, topics, especially of a theological nature, get to know your subject matter too, Mm -hmm. a little, Mm -hmm. a little better as well. That way you're able to, to make good cases for whatever it is that you want to say Mm. without um, sounding like someone who hasn't studied up on, on something before. Um, it is hard with with the blogosphere and with so with with the the internet because anymore anybody can post anything. Yeah. There there used to be a time when if I wanted to 
get my opinion out, uh, it needed to, it was going to cost me. Maybe I'd need to buy a printing press and buy paper and ink and pay somebody to typeset it. Maybe I could have a newsletter that could be like a, the ancient version of a blog, <laughs> but still it was going to cost me a lot more. And I need to make sure, am I really, do I really think this highly of what I'm about to say? Right. That I need to go through this kind of sacrifice to get it out. Well, it's but, so easy to do now because all we need to do is link. Oh, yeah. Uh, post a link <laughs> as a comment to someone's yep. response, right? Oh, and, and just even posting content. You get a WordPress blog for free. And I, I my my first blog post is, you know, why Jared's political candidate is terrible and Jared is an idiot for, for following that political candidate. <laughs> Send or post. Right. And it's done. It's out there. Yeah. You know, now and, and it's cost me nothing. And yet now it's part of this 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 source, this internet. Um, now there's a lot of people who have uh, more sophisticated arguments than that, but they're not necessarily peer reviewed, right? You have a you know, you have like the New England Journal of Medicine, let's say. Uh, an article about, let's say, some new new policy related to coronavirus. An article in one of these journals has to be thumbs up, as it were, but not just by somebody clicking on it, but by scholars who have read the article in a blind review. The names are taken off it, identifying features taken off it, and they have to evaluate the merits of that argument and give their approval before that journal will publish it. But again, with with a blog... Nobody has to approve what I'm saying. Nobody has to say, uh, you forgot to cite these important sources. Um, instead, it just goes up there. Now, there are people who some social media sites are beginning to censor certain things, and that kind of gets into its own uh, its own separate mm-hmm. separate discussion. But, uh, boy, it's just so, so easy to find web content uh, and to cite that as an authority, like you say, just post a link, and that doesn't always really help people get to the truth. Right. Well, as we bring this to a close, I mean, we've we've kind of covered a, a wide range of, of different things. I mean, what earlier in, in another uh, podcast we did talk about how valuable uh, social media can be for churches. The web can be for churches. It, social media can be really useful, even for expressing our opinions about things. Um, I've tried, uh, not always successfully, but I've tried before I've shared something to to ask myself, is this really going to be edifying for the kinds of people that follow me? And if it's something that I think is that I'm very passionate about, um, a, a principle or a truth or a position or something that I, I really want to defend, you know, I want my words to be fitly spoken. Proverbs uh, uh, twenty five eleven: a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Or, um, or again, uh, uh, Proverbs sixteen verse twenty three: the heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Um, or you know, sixteen twenty one: the wise of heart is called discerning, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. And so, I need, I, I want to ask that question: is this, is this? A persuasive article that I'm going to send, and is the way I'm framing this article going to best persuade the person I that I disagree with, ultimately for for building up? Is this going to somehow draw people toward me so that we can iron can sharpen iron? If I post this political article or this theological uh, position, um, is this going to um, is this going to create a conversation that can really involve some back and forth growth. Uh, that, that's that's I think um, something I've I've sought to do, um, but something we could really do as we're um, as we're posting. I want to build people up. I want people to grow, and I want to move toward these people. And I think we could even maybe go the next step and and say, I deep down want my social media presence to be a a tool that makes my actual face-to-face interpersonal presence better right? rather than becoming an alternative to that. So that my, I would love it if my, what I, this article I just shared or this blog post I just shared, I would love it if a friend writes back and says, I'd like to talk with you more about this. See, could, could we grab coffee tomorrow? That mm-hmm. would be great because that would actually then facilitate our relationships together. If only we had more social media interactions that led ultimately to in-person interactions or web chats or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's an important time, I think, for Christians 
to use social media in ways that that points people to to God and His glory, uh, mm-hmm. to Jesus Christ and His mercy, right? Uh, and pastors especially to to model for their congregations and elders and church leaders how to use social media yeah. really in ways that reflect the heart of a pastor or church leader, being ambassadors for for their Savior. Well, even on our uh, use of social media, it's good to continuously ask us that question in the Westminster Standards. What is the chief and highest end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Mm-hmm. And also to reflect upon what Ephesians five fifteen through 16 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Making the best use of our time, even on social media. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation between Reverend Compton and myself on social media. Next time we'll talk about Christianity in the arts, including film, music, and literature, with Dr. Strange joining us for that discussion. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on sermonaudio.com as Mid-America Reformed Seminary. You can find us as well on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to search Mid-America Reformed Seminary. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.